Gordy, man, how you doing? I'm doing good, Eric. How you doing? I'm doing really good. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, man, I don't even know where to start. Uh, you, uh, you know, I long time ago when I was trying to learn gunsmithing. Obviously, I think everybody nowadays is trying to learn gunsmithing, and for a while now, they've run across your DVDs, your uh, articles, and uh, I mean, you've been doing yeah. a lot in the uh, teaching sector. Yeah. For a long time, so I, yeah, I'm gonna tell you as a as a once uh, wanna be gunsmith, I I appreciate the the knowledge that you put out. Thank you. Yeah, I've been, yeah, just uh, you know, can't do this forever, and yeah, just want to pass pass it on as best I can to help people. I enjoy doing that, and and you know, God's given me a gift for doing that. I think to help people out like that and to teach, and so I just enjoy doing that. So yeah, well, thank you. Um, the uh, where 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 do you get started gunsmithing? Was that your passion forever, or was that something that you kind of fell into? Yeah, my well, shooting has been a passion forever. You know, I started out like a little kid, a little BB gun, you know, and and always setting up little targets to shoot at. Just you know, a little kid, I just did that. You know, I had had fun doing that. And I'm a hunter to some extent, but not near like I am like shooting targets and stuff, but. But I'm real mechanical. I just love love mechanics and mechanical things. And you know, I used to build and race drag cars and things like that. And you know, when I first went to uh, was out of high school, I went to, to trade school for a couple of years for auto mechanics. Well, I got uh, you know pretty good mechanical background from that. But I did not enjoy doing auto mechanics that much. You know, of course, I was up in Iowa and working under cars and trucks and school bus in the winter time with ice and snow dripping on you. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. But, I like building the hot rods and doing that kind of stuff, but, but, uh, so I thought, you know, just, and I, I, I like doing that, but then, uh, some guys in the local police department, uh, one of them was a reserve officer I was working with. And, and so they kind of got to know me a little bit. Well, then the chief came to me one day in the shop there and said, he wouldn't be interested in becoming a police officer with you. would kind of like to have somebody. So yeah, I'll do that. So I went to talk to my wife, you know, and, so then I was a police officer for quite a few years and I, I enjoyed doing investigation. I got tired of writing traffic tickets real fast. You know, after six months or a year of that, I was really sick of doing that. But but uh, doing the investigations, I, I love doing investigations. So I was the investigator for our department for you know, all the years I was working there, about 12 years. And But I always had to have part-time jobs to make ends meet. So I was gone all the time, you know, and gone from the family and the kids and they were growing up and and uh, stuff like that. So, so I thought it's got to be something I can do at home. To make some money and uh so i was at a gun show one time with a friend of mine one of the other cops and and uh i just we got, we got talking you know, boy there's nobody around here to really fix guns or do anything like that and I, was, I got thinking about that you know so i if i went to the next gun show just with, you know, quit looking at guns just went and talked to everybody at every table that had anything to do with gunsmithing to see if they had any interest in that if there was if or if there was any uh you know how busy they were Every single one of them was, was busy, you know, super busy. Anybody that had anything against something was busy. Said, okay, well, maybe there is something here. So, so I took a correspondence course, you know, home study course through modern guns, you know, gun school, and uh, did that at home. Took, it took a couple of years, I suppose, to do that. But, but uh, well, that took the mystery out of it. Well, that's how they do it. I can do that, you know. <laughs> I'm mechanically inclined, so if I can read, you know, read how something's done, I can do that. So, so I just started, you know, got an FFL and started buying tools and started just doing repair work. And, and then right away I got involved with competitive shooting because that, that's something I really enjoy doing. It's just like, it's like drag racing, it's competing, you know, I just right. get the competitive mindset, I guess. But, but uh, so I went, uh, went to our local, local club and says, I'd like to run a Pinterest range here on your club. Is that okay? So I had to go through the board meeting and stuff like that. And well, that was fine with them if I ran it. And uh, there was no organized matches in the area at all. So I, uh, that was, and then, so they, uh, that was BR 50 room fire bench rest at the time. <clears throat> so that was probably 91, maybe that I started shooting or doing BR 50. So I, I ran, I was BR 50 club then, see, and, and uh, so I got involved with bench rest starting out in room fire. Man, I enjoyed that. That was so much fun, you know. And then, uh, well, then the Varmint Hunter uh, Association started up with Varmint Hunter Magazine, and they started doing the jamborees. 
So I think the first jamboree, uh, that's a balloon shoot out in the middle of South Dakota. Well, that, uh, the learn hunter started actually in Oklahoma, but then they went to South Dakota. And, and then the first jamboree they had, I think, was 94. And uh, so I went there just to watch, you know, I was advertising the magazine already. And, and so I went there and the first day I went there, I walked up to the people that ran it. And I said, you know, volunteer, I'll get the only thing that can help, you know, need, need any help with, I'll be glad to do it. As I run a Ventress range back in Iowa and, and uh, done that for two or three years now. And, and uh, uh, yeah, I should say, you wouldn't want to be the range master, would you? <laughs> So we've never we've never run a match in our lives. We're gonna to try to wing it, you know. So you don't want to wing something that big. You're like 300 people from all over the world come to this thing. We all do that. And so I was a range master for every single damn breeze there ever was in the 90s war. I think the last one was 2010, I believe. So I was a range master for every one of them and uh never ever shot that course. Wow. <laughs> I think I'm probably the only person that never shot that course. But I was always up in the tower running the match, you know, and and uh we just really enjoy doing that. I met so many great people doing that. And, and, uh, so then I wanted to get involved in, uh, then I was getting interested in, in, uh, I was doing some short range, like you know, 100, 200 yard bench rest. You thought our local club doing that as well as the rim fire. And then, but I want to do thousand yard shooting. There was nobody in the whole Midwest that did thousand yard shooting. I knew of. And, uh, so I went, what took a long time to find a range or a, a you know, farm that I could shoot on it was safe for one thing you gotta, you gotta have a safe background and uh, but, but the homeowner or the rancher or the farmer was was okay with it and all this stuff and and uh well the one local uh local sheriff which I knew really well you know professionally and and uh yeah he he had a, he was a farmer he had, you know, I don't know how many hundred acres he had but you know it's a river bottom ground just beautiful beautiful farm I was ready catfishing out on the river and stuff and camping out there behind this place once in a while. So I knew him and I knew the lay of the land and well, they had a huge hill that uh, was a thousand yards away from the river camp we were shooting at or where he was camping at, I mean. And, and uh, so, yeah, he let me set up a match there, set up a range there. And so I just did a, a that year, I, I set up some practice matches, just some fun matches, some thousand yard matches, see if there was any interest in it. There was a huge interest in that. I didn't know ahead of time, obviously, but Man, had people come from how many different states had come to that just to come and shoot with us and just have we had so much fun doing that. But it wasn't a real safe range because the only way down there was uh where you had to drive down past the edge of this hill and drive across in front of the firing line. You're about a quarter mile out was where the where the where the field road was to get back to where we were shooting. So you're actually shooting over top of people, so you had to watch that they were there. Well, later in the year, you know, corn in Iowa gets 12, 14 foot tall. It's huge. <laughs> Well, you'd be you'd have cars driving through there, you can't see them. So, hey, we can't run a match here. We did a few of them, a few matches there. We just too dangerous. I don't dare do this. And so, I shut that place down. And then I found it. Then I, but then I was off the police department. I was enough to on the fire department. I was, you know, on the fire department for, you know, as a volunteer fire, you know, firefighter. And so, I did that for 20 some years, about 20 years, I guess. And I mean, one of the other firefighters uh, ran a hunting club that had, uh, they'd go out and plant pheasants and quail and sucker and stuff like that. And then, then uh, people would come in there with their dogs and and go set up hunts for different people, you know? And so he had a different farm, you know, several miles away from this one, still on the, on the same river, but beautiful, beautiful country down in there. So, so we went, so I went down there and checked it all out and and we shot one, just one practice match down in the, in the river valley. I get 2,500 uh, yards at this place. And, but we was too flat. It was too far down in the river valley. Well, the black dirt in Iowa, that's the barrage coming off that ground. You couldn't see target 300 yards hardly, <laughs> you know, on a hot day. We had to move farther up the hill, which was a blessing because there was a big old barn up there that they had converted to a hunting lodge. Mm. Looked like a barn, a farm barn from the outside on a, on a farmyard. Inside is a beautiful hunting lodge, you know, just a nice place, kitchen and you know, dining area and and I had a separate whole enclosed porch area. We use that as our as our target target uh, scoring room, you know. And but then we was up, you know, quite a way quite a ways up this hill. So we were shooting fifty or seventy five feet above the ground, I suppose. So the mirage went away, so, so we could see target. But then I hired a uh, you know a guy on a dozer to come out and put up the firing line. Uh, one of the guys who goes to my church is a surveyor friend of mine, so he came out and he surveyed it, laid it all out. And, 
And uh, so we laid the firing. So that's how the Iowa Thousand Yard Club was born. And uh, so I uh, ran that for, I think, from, I think until 2010. So we shut that down. The guy that owned the ground, uh, I could never get him to give us a contract. So I knew we could stay there. No, 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 you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> well, he got sick and died real suddenly. Mm -hmm. Well, then the family, the corporate farm and the family wanted us out of there then. And so we, but I'd been running matches for 20 some years. By that time, I was tired of running matches. And so I shut that down and sold all my, all my benches, all my equipment and stuff like that. And that was in 2010, I guess, when that was. So, but anyway, yes, yeah, so I've been involved in, you know, different disciplines and shooting and things like that. But, but yeah, that's my, that's my basic background, I guess. So. Well, that's a pretty good one. You ask me. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's been so, enjoyable. Yeah. Um, so, how do you actually get into gunsmithing like full time? Well, because I, uh, I was still in the police department. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started, I you know, took this correspondence course, this home study course, and, and just started, started gunsmithing. And, and right away, I was just buried. And Within the first, at the end of the first year, I was working you know, 40 hours full time as a police investigator, 50 hours part time for myself, and I had a guy working for me. And that was in 1987. I haven't been caught up since. That, that, <laughs> you know, I'm still busy as long as I get out. That part time, and, uh, that part time really gets you, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know it. exactly. But uh, but I've been, you know, so, so I saw the handwriting on the wall, so I, you know, quit the police department and. and doing it full what been doing it to full time uh rather rather soon there and yeah been doing it ever since so so how do you get um i imagine you're getting a lot of work from all the guys going to the range oh yeah how i assume the way you were doing it then and the way you were doing it now are different oh yeah how has the progression, so how does the progression happen? Because I've met a lot of gunsmiths uh, who shall remain nameless that they doing it now pretty much the same way they were doing it 30 years ago. And honestly, when I see that, I immediately just shake their hand and back away because yeah. if you are not questioning your own methods and, and trying to always do better, I'm not so sure. I don't know. The, the way I see it is you shouldn't fall in love with the first thing you ever learn. <laughs> That's smart. Yeah. So how does that happen to you? What, what, what leads you to, to this, uh, I'm going to call it innovation in gunsmithing to where you're literally questioning your own methods. Yeah. I just, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm say very mechanically inclined, but I'm also very, uh, very anal about stuff. I really, when I send something out to a customer, I really want to make sure it's right, as, as good as I possibly can. Once in a while, stuff had come out not as good as I would like it to. I didn't know why. So I, so I have forever, and I still do it all the time. I test things all the time. I test things, and I try this, try that. When I start getting something that works repeatedly every time, well, then I start trusting that method. And uh, sometimes there's issues that come up that I don't care for. And there's, there's obviously, there's, you know, there's, and you know this too, there's, diff there's different ways of doing things that are, and this way's right, this way's right. They both work extremely well. Some of the very, very top gunsmiths are doing things this way. Others, very, very top gunsmiths are doing this way. There's no one right way to do so much of this stuff. And, uh, but I've got to work with what works for me, what comes out good with me and what I, gives me the results I'm looking for. Test and test and test. A lot of times the stuff that it, the conventional ways, like some of the gunsmithing tools, schools, the way they teach, teach certain things, weren't giving me very consistent results at all. And uh, so I try this, I try this, try this. Well, I don't have very many of my own guns, but I got a lot of my customer guns here. <laughs> you know, so I practice and experiment on their guns. But and I, uh, you know, I, I get feedback from the customers uh, and say, you know, tell me, tell me how they do and, and how it works and. Now, especially in the competitive environment, then you've got, you can have a guy say, yeah, my gun really should be good. What does that mean? But if I got a guy that's going to matches and consistently winning matches and, and consistently doing good and then barrel after barrel or gun after gun after gun works good for him and for the other guy, for the other guy. Uh, and then, 
you change something and they start shooting better and it consistently shoot better, better, better all the time. Well, then you start learning something. So that's kind of how I've done my whole career. And I still do that all the time. I'm continually experimenting with things and, and some experiments don't work out very good. A lot of them do, you know, it just, you just don't know. Well, so you yeah, just, just like you're talking about, believe the target. That's exactly right. <laughs> Cause that's really what, what the whole end result is, is, is how it, you, you can think what you want on something, but how, how it shows up on the target, what, what the actual good that it's doing, that's, that's what they're, what you have to have. So. Yeah, absolutely. And you can't be afraid to fail. Uh, I've learned this a long time ago and man, some of the, some of the best learning lessons have been whenever I thought, well, if I screw it up, oh, well, I'm yeah. just going to try. And, uh, all of a sudden, you, you find this because uh, whenever you're afraid to screw something up, you're not the only one that's had that thought before. Yeah. But most people are going to say, well, I'm not going to do it because that'll probably screw it up. And they just don't do it, which means they are never going to go and find the next thing that 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 you will find once you are willing to destroy something or screw it up. And oftentimes for me it, it also doesn't work like i will actually destroy a lot of things but it's never for nothing i will learn something from it and i go ah if i had done that but a different way it would have worked right Cause, yeah because even when you screw something up you learn from that and you, you go, learn from it you go absolutely like i i'm a self-taught machinist and the term machinist i'm going to use very loosely but yeah still I run machines, but I taught myself, uh, by watching YouTube and watching a lot of, you know, mainly YouTube and reading and just like everybody else does. Uh, and I would start making a part like on a weekend, I, I draw it up and I start making it. And then hours and hours into it, I realized I went about it the wrong way. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, Oh, yeah. now what? You know what I mean? And then, yeah. And then I'd be like, okay, that one's, that one's scrap. However, I need to do this before <laughs> that, and then it'll work. You know what I'm saying? Sure. And it start all over again. But that's when I learn the most. Whenever, whenever I make a simple part that you know you chuck it up in the lathe and make it and pull it out and you're done. I didn't learn as much as when I, <laughs> when I got stuck to yeah. the point that I couldn't go any further because I I made you know I did one step in the reverse order or whatever you know. Yeah. So I think barrels are the same way. Uh, and I understand people don't want to screw up a very expensive barrel, especially now that they're hard to get, hard to come by. But I do things <laughs> like uh, to this day that I'm like, this is probably going to screw it up. <laughs> well, let's find <laughs> out, you know? Yeah, exactly. Anyway, uh, I, I've took, and I'm not, suggesting that anybody does this okay but i was having a hell of a hard time cleaning out cleaning out a barrel one day it had carbon buildup like you can't believe uh i shot it suppressed at a prs match for like it, it got it it got carbon buildup to the point that i was blowing primers it was so bad so of course i was upset at this barrel and i'm cleaning it out and it's just it's just it's baked on there so, you know, I'm using IOSO and JB board paste and all the, all the typical suspects. Oh yeah. It ain't working. So screw it. I took some, some 600 grit lapping compound valve lapping ca uh, compound and I went yeah. after it and that got it out <laughs> and I was so mad. And I thought if I screw it up, it screwed up and <laughs> I can't, you know, it wasn't, it was a PRS rifle. So, uh, you know, it still shot half MOA or, or better. So I was happy with it, but I'm still not brave enough to do that to a, to an F-class barrel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, Come on, but, man. <laughs> but I haven't needed to, right? I haven't yeah. needed to. But yeah. the, the point is, I was like, what the hell? If I screw it up, I screw it up. And that's the thing. So I will tell you this, though. Taking the lapping compound to that PRS barrel and not seeing a noticeable amount of damage. I, like, I didn't see anything. Like, even on target, it didn't degrade anything. So that help me be much uh more stress-free whenever i run i sure. also in a 
match barrel because I go I also is nothing compared to that 600 grit lapping compound and yeah. if that if I didn't see any damage with that then I'm definitely not going to see anything here so it did something you know at least in my head to to at least be uh be relieved about the uh, stress of running abrasives because that's a lot of people they are scared to death about running abrasives and oh yeah oh, I know what <laughs> the, the one thing you got to remember Make sure your cleaning rod rotates with the rifling. <laughs> yeah, don't go, don't go the other a, way. I've got a barrel here that I, I, I save barrels of anything I can use in my classes and stuff like that. For years, I've saved those where I can show them. But I got a barrel that's uh, it's a smoothbore barrel for about, I don't know, 14, 15 inches. And the next, so about half the barrel is a smoothbore, half of it's got rifling in it. Well, the guy, the guy uh, brought me his gun, and I barreled it, you know, years before that. The guy was a pretty dog gun. And the guy came to me and says, yeah, he says, I want a uh, barrel maker. Give me, give me a new barrel for free. Why? I was out hunting and 2.30 on Thursday afternoon, this rifle quit shooting. I had ruined my hunt. <laughs> okay. How many rounds you got through? Oh, about 4,500. It was a 22 to 50 actually approved. Wow. You know? And uh, I was, okay, I'll, I know the, I know the barrel maker. I, and uh, I was all, all I'll tell him what you said. I don't know if he'll do anything, but I'll, I'll, I'll let him know what you said and mm -hmm. what you want and so forth. <laughs> anyway, all the barrel maker, I'm going to say, barrel. this is what the guy's story is. I'll let you just decide what you want to do about it, but this is what he wants. Okay. So I sound the barrel to him about a week later, the phone rings. The guy says, Gordy, I said, I'm not going to give you a new barrel. I'm not going to give him a new barrel. I know you're not. <laughs> uh, but what happened, the guy was, she, was, Consistently using JB or I also like you, he was using JB, I believe, but, but but the whole life of the barrel, and he was short stroking ahead of the chamber after he cleaned it, you know, to get rid of the fouling and mm -hmm. build up and stuff like that. Then he'd go on shooting. Well, I think it's on 2 30 on Thursday afternoon on that hunt, he, he missed a prairie dog that he thought he should have hit. And and that's why I decided that barrel was, was no good, but the, his cleaning rod wasn't rotating, so he was stripping. The rifle, wow. the, 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 the abrasion was going over top of the lands and groups of the first half of the barrel. See, so what he was doing. And uh, so I called him up, told him what the barrel maker was. He said, well, I didn't think he would, I didn't think he would give me one, but I had to try. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he laughed, you know. But I said, check your cleaning rod. I said, is that thing rotating? He called it back. No, it's not rotating as it's supposed to. That, that's what's <laughs> wrong with your barrel. You ruined your own barrel. <laughs> well, 4,500 rounds. He got his money's worth. Yeah. Especially oh, out of a 22,250. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. What? What's a? This is a. This is a, a topic that I see pop up, pop up quite often, and, and it, it's popping up even more now. When now that it's even harder to get barrels, but uh, people always want. Okay, I don't want to say always, but oftentimes yeah. want a rifle that shoots really good, like really, really good, that can win matches, but gives you <laughs> really good ballistics. But has a really long barrel life, and and I tell them I say you got to pick one or two. Like you can't. Barrels are like race car tires, right? Oh yeah. So what's in your opinion a good barrel life like? To where you say yeah, if you can get that, you you got your money's worth. I think it depends a lot on what your expectation of accuracy is. One thing, yeah, with a benchress barrel or an F class barrel or. A a real serious competitive barrel that, that requires extremely, you know, extremely good accuracy. The barrel life's not going to be near what it is on a, like on a hunting gun or prairie dog rifle, right? something right. like that. And so I guess a lot of it there. So depends on the, on the, how much powder you're shooting is a large, is a large part. How much pressure you're running, you're running super, super, super hot loads. You got a whole lot more pressure. It's uh, got more, more flames. You'd like Growth burn out a little bit faster, do it that way. So if you back off your powder, don't run quite so hard. If you get a little bit node that 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 your accuracy is really good and not jack the pressure sky high, and that that helps. So just I guess that's more of a variable. There's just yeah, uh, I, I I guess uh, you are a bench shooter, right? Or that's kind of mm -hmm. what you cut your teeth. Thousand yard bench mostly, range. but long range. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's talk about that because I don't have a lot lot of uh, experience. Well, actually, I've never shot a a, a bench rest match, bench rest of any kind. Yeah. But what is it? Uh, you guys are very. You shoot for a group or score? Both, actually. We we, the, we shoot like a five shot group and light gun. They have IBS when I uh, who I set up with, but 
and then a, a 10 shot group, group in heavy gap, but you count the group, you or the count the, you know, make sure all your, all your shots are on paper, obviously. Right. Uh, you measure the group and that's, that, that's your group win or your, or your group score, mm-hmm. your, your group measurement. But you also count the score. So you're actually counting both things at the same time. Now, group takes precedence. Yeah. You can't win both. I was going to say, I was going to say, yeah. you, you probably, you probably shoot for group and, and, uh, score is just a byproduct. I assume if you could see the holes and you shot out here in the nine, you wouldn't shift over to try to hit X's. <laughs> no, in a thousand yard, you really can't. Score. I know, but I'm uh, saying if you never could, see the whole, yeah, you're right. If you could, you'd be like, no, no, no. I want a nice tight group. Oh, yeah. I don't, oh, yeah. I, yeah. yeah, exactly. So. Anyway, you guys use six millimeters. Is now that, that's what most is, of the guys is that are still running. King, yeah, yeah, it is right now. So, <sighs> dashers, BRAs, and yeah. things of the nature. What's yeah. the barrel life on one of those? Like for competitive thousand yard ventures, thousand fifteen hundred rounds. Okay, the hot you're running it. Okay, yeah. So it's not much different than F class. Uh, F class, we get a little, a little more because of the the nature of the game, right? It's yeah. Uh, you can squeeze more out of out, out of one. Uh, what is your? Uh, do you tune at a hundred or do you tune at a thousand? What do you do? Long range, typically at about. Well, it depends on where you're at, but, but the, the, the place I sh- uh, do it is about is about uh, four fifty to five hundred. Uh-huh. Do most of it there. Do initial a little bit, you know, at two hundred to get started, but it really seems to help get the trajectory. Start getting some drop coming into play. You're, you're, you start seeing your, you can have really low extreme spreads, but have still a vertical in your group. So you can tune that out at that distance that you can't see it up close nearly as well. So really prefer to do it at farther out. So, how do you tune that out? With uh, seating depth, a lot of it, you know, your your neck tension or powder charge, you run the powder charge up and down uh, initially to get that. And then just the seating depth and neck tension primarily. So sometimes change powders if, if you get something, but or, or primers, I mean, but uh, yeah, just just uh, primarily the neck tension and, and the seating depth. So. The, uh, is that positive compensation or what? what's doing that? What do you mean? Well, you have ext- low extreme spreads. It shoots good at a hundred, let's just say, right? But. Yeah. Sometimes at a thousand, it needs a little more attention. What's costing that? Do you think it's a positive compensation or just the load? It's just showing you something at long range that you're not seeing at a hundred yards because you know at some point they all look like one whole groups, right? Yeah. Yeah. The uh, the I'll give up a little bit of extreme spread to get the vertical out of the groups <laughs> that distance, I guess. Uh, sometimes I think it's, it's in the, where the bullet is leaving in the barrel harmonics, you know, makes, makes a difference. And I'm no, I haven't done a ton of work with this. I'm more of a gunsmith than I am a shooter, but uh, some of the guys I've built rivals for and worked with over the years uh, are extremely good at doing this stuff. And they know a whole lot more about it than I do, but, but uh the yeah, that's. I don't mind having a little extra extreme spread if I if I keep the vertical out of the groups consistently at that range. The consistency well, is a big thing. So. Well, that's what I'm asking. Uh, like, because I've seen the same. Like I, I obviously want low extreme spread, low standard deviations, right? But ultimately, yeah. I believe the target. And yeah, that's what's really going to tell. I've you. shot my best group ever has been 1.3 inches at a thousand for five shots, right? Yeah. And a lot of people have seen that on, on my YouTube channel because I just happened to be running the camera when I did it. Yeah. And most people have not noticed yeah. that my extreme spread was 19. Yeah. And, you know, that just, <laughs> multiple things happened there, right? Like, number one, that, that was lucky. I, I wish I could duplicate it over and over and over, but I can't. The best <clears throat> I've done it's like 1.9 inches, uh, you know, besides that. But the main thing is that extreme spread. I don't put a whole lot. I, I let it kind of tell me if I'm on the right path, but I don't let it dictate the path. Yeah, yeah. And that's where it kind of gets a little muddy. The waters get a little muddy because uh, 
yeah, everybody wants to see those extreme spreads like single digits. But I don't know what it is. I mean, I'm not I'm 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 testing it, I'm experimenting with it, but I just think that the error in the chronograph itself yeah, oh is, yeah. is large enough that you can't really trust it. Yep. So that's what I'm saying is do you believe in positive compensation? I don't I'm not even familiar with that, I guess, with that term. Yeah, so positive compensation is the idea that if you have, let's say, large ES, let, let's just call it 20. Okay. Um, and that's not large, so let's call it 40, just because. Yeah. Just for emphasis. Uh, that the slower bullet is in the barrel longer. Therefore, if the barrel's oscillating like this, you know, and the slower bullet, because it's in the barrel longer, it's going to leave at a higher depth departure angle like this yeah okay and then the faster bullet is in the barrel less time so as the barrel's coming up it doesn't whip up as high as high so it leaves here this is the fast this is the slow but because this one's slower and this one's faster this one's going to catch up to it at some point this one's going to fall faster this one's it's mm -hmm. going faster and at some point they're going to converge at, at and, the target, and yeah. At the target, and <clears throat> and there, people that that believe in positive compensation hate it when I say this, and they're magically going to become happy family all over again, and uh, and all of a sudden they all come together at the target. That's what I call positive compensation. I think it exists. I. Don't ever ever rely on it or tune for it because I just sure. I just don't know that I uh, <clears throat> because if they converge if they cross at one point that means they're gonna cross that means past that point it's gonna get worse right yeah and anyway so that's why I don't rely on it or I don't even try to tune for it uh, and it sounds like you don't either uh, but that's a well there's a guy in actually there's a guy in Texas. A lot of great, a lot of great innovation comes out of Texas, by the uh -huh. way. You, you know that you're from there. Uh, but he was, I don't can't remember, he was at the Varma Hunter Jamboree or at one of our at one of my thousand yard matches at Iowa or whether that a nationals, but I got I knew the guy, I've been to several matches with him and got to know him. And but he was doing this testing, doing this. I didn't hadn't heard the term positive compensation, but that's exactly what he was doing. And I think he was using a barrel tuner to do it too, but I think he was he was working his loads and he says he working and working and working at it. He said, I pretty well can make it do this. And to where it, it, it you know, begins the, the, the slower barrel time, the barrel has, mm -hmm. has a chance, to, or the slower, slower bolt has the barrel in the barrel longer, so the, but he would adjust the tune in the barrel harmonics to, to allow that to happen. He says, and I could get them to where they pretty well come back together and get a really good groups at a thousand yards, even with a lot of, of extreme spread difference. And, but he was just doing a lot of experimentation and testing with this and, and he's now shooting ELR, you know, the extreme long range stuff. And, mm -hmm. but, uh, you just, it's that type of thinking outside the box. People can learn from that. It may not be anything to it. Who knows? But, but people like that, that test and test them, man, people can learn from that, but other people go, go with that or he continues to test and learns more. And, but that's interesting stuff. You know, every, so. every, every time, uh, I I've had a few of my teammates bring it up and yeah, I just kind of, I just tell them, I don't believe in magic. Right. And, yeah, that that pretty much ends the conversation. But I have, I have tested it and I have played around with it. And I'm just, I just can't. Where I shoot is is not calm most of the time, so it's hard to yeah. even, you know, anytime you have wind, you have uh, aerodynamic jump, right? And it's really hard to to uh, to tune for positive compensation. But I think there's something to it. I think it exists. I just don't know. Oh, yeah enough about it or or i just don't know how to go about it you know being Where, able to control it would be the tough part. that's that's the one yeah now i know when i you know like when i play around with my tuners i can make the groups tall and i can yep. make them oh, yeah. wide you know a tuner can make them wide can make them tall and oh then, absolutely and all of a sudden they come together right so i think there's something to it because how can how can they get taller simply by turning a tuner well that yeah. would be, in my opinion, uh, but I, that wouldn't be positive compensation because 
I, again, I don't understand it enough to to really be yeah, able to yeah. explain it or even uh, tune for it. But there's so much out there that we just I don't understand that I would like to. <laughs> well, yeah. Look, look how much we know now. We didn't know 20 years ago. And what's 20 years from now going to be? So that's for this type of thing. You never know where it's going to go. Who's, who's going to come up with something that can control that and make it work and just things like that, you know, and the equipment gets better, the you know, the bullets and components get better and the shooters get better. They learn more and more and more, you know, stuff like your, like your, your podcast, you get to talk to a ton of different people and people learn from that. You're just passing on knowledge that everybody has and everybody's sharing it. And that's just awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you. The, um, Barrel tuners. Uh, you mentioned barrel tuners. How yeah. prevalent are they in long range ventures? Not, not a lot. I put a, I put quite a few on. Uh, more and more all the time. It seems like, uh, but I haven't been. Uh, you know, nothing like the R rimfire ventures, for example. That's I mean, <laughs> any serious rimfire venture shooter is going to be using them, and uh, I'm not involved in short range ventures much, other than just locally here at our you know, the local club here i shoot at once in a while that 100 and 200 yard score match so i'm kind of learning that game which is a lot of fun yeah that's the only thing that's close to me right here now i moved to florida but but um th there's guys there that use tuners and and swear by them and they, they work there's no two ways about it they, they do work so the uh something i saw, saw at shot show that blew me away was air rifles yeah I was looking at these things and I've heard about them. I have a lot of customers, believe it or not, that use my tuners on air rifles. Oh yeah. And I can I, believe it. They kept asking for half 20 threads, half 20. I said, who the hell uses half 20? And they said, air rifles. <laughs> I said, okay. So we started making half 20 adapters. My goodness. They, they sell. Uh, and, and I, I had to finally reach out to one of them. I said, all right, what's going on? They said, oh, so he started sending me pictures of his groups with these air rifles and oh, yeah. they are tiny. And I said, what do you do? He goes, I shoot Ventress. So there's a Ventress. They, they shoot PRS. They shoot Ventress. They shoot ELR with, with yeah. freaking uh, air rifles. <laughs> I know it. And I kept thinking just pellet guns. No, these things are full blown Ventress rigs that they shoot pellets at like 1200 feet per second. Or it, it's crazy. Crazy. Oh, yeah. So you don't have powder charge to worry about. So they're more consistent that way and get the pellets the, the same. And yeah, they oh, have yeah, these regulators on the air tanks and all yep. that. And supposedly you can get like five feet per second extreme spreads out of these things. So yeah, it's amazing what people do with those things. Long story short, I'm getting an air rifle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> I can't afford not to, Gordy. Yeah. No, I can believe that. <laughs> they're. That's, I walked the entire shot show, and that's the one thing that got me excited. I, I you know, there's so much to see there, and I saw oh, so yeah. much cool stuff. But these air rifles, learning about yeah. them, I was like, holy crap, I need one. So, yeah, I'm getting an air rifle, but it's, uh, it's there. I, I can't explain how freaking awesome they are, and I'm yeah. gonna, I'm gonna get one, put it on my channel, and start learning and put it out there for other people to see because i'm telling you i was blown away by by these things like they have their own little press where you can make your own pellets and i mean that is completely up my alley you know <laughs> and the pellets they have ballistic tip pellets and they have it, it just goes on and on and on it's it's pretty incredible <laughs> oh i know they're back in the early 90s when i was doing br 50 I was doing the rim fire part, but they also had an AR or had an air gun class. And those guys are shooting phenomenal. That was back in the nineties. I can't imagine how much farther they've come since then. That was 30 years ago, you know? Yeah, they have. Anyway, it was pretty amazing <laughs> uh, to see what, what, uh, what they're doing with these things. And like, I immediately thought, Oh man, uh, you know, cause I don't know anything about air rifles. Uh, I don't know what kind of barrels they use, you know, but I'm like, you know how it is. Like you, I can't help, but to, try to implement what i know into that and i yeah, thought well exactly the first thing that's going to happen is that thing's coming apart and i'm going to see how how those barrels are put <laughs> yeah, on there. exactly and uh <laughs> you know and i'm going to experiment with different barrels and twist rates and you know and again i don't even know 
I don't know if Brooks is going to want to hear it from me when, when I call him up and go, hey, I'm doing air <laughs> rifles now. Can you make me an air rifle barrel? That... <laughs> but anyway, it's it's uh, it was very interesting to see what they're doing with those things. You bet. That's awesome. So speaking of innovation and, and all these things that, that happened, I mean, barrels are better. Actions are bear, uh, better. Stocks, scopes, you name it. Even scope rings and mounts and level. Oh, yeah. I mean, every single aspect of shooting, the shooting rests, uh, the bullets, especially the bullets, everything has gotten better. However, the Remington 700 platform has yet to be improved on. I mean, yeah. they improve on it, but it's still the same, the same thing. What makes the Remington 700 <laughs> so good? Like the small block Chevy of the gun right? world it's, type of thing, you know? Every time I see uh, a brand new action be released, it's like, well, it's going to be a Remington 700 clone of some type. You know what I'm well, saying? Some of that, I think anyway, uh, some of that I think is because there's so much components that they'll fit. Right. So it's a marketing thing. I mean, it's a good marketing if it'll at least fit into a Remington chassis and the Remington stock and the Remington triggers that go into it and and, uh, and and so forth. So that but that's kind of a shape of things for, for a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, the action itself, uh, very good, but, you know, per, you know, quick lock time, obviously. Um, but you've got uh, very good ignition if it's set up right. You got real good ignition out of those things. Um, the uh, and I don't know a lot about this, how much this comes into play, but the weight of like the firing pin and all that stuff and how much vibration that puts into a gun when it fires, you know, some, um, sometimes guys go to the super lightweight, you know, like a titanium firing pins and stuff like that. And I've not had real good success with that yeah, I, I, helping I, accuracy because maybe, maybe it's quicker lock time. Uh, adventurous, we don't need quicker lock time. You know, we need good ignition. Well, the ignition can suffer from that sometimes, and so I really pay attention to to, to ignition out hard and hitting the primer and 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 all that stuff. And and uh, if that's it, all I'll, I'll go to a heavier, uh, you know, slower lock time to get better ignition in a heartbeat if I if I if that's what it takes. So yeah. But other yeah. than that, it's just it's just a, just a good design, a time proven design, and I don't know. You know, people keep improving on things. I'm sure there'll be something come along better as, as time goes along that's consistent. But they, right now, it's 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 a top, very very top design that people are emulating and working with. Yeah, it, it just works. And yeah, I uh, you talk about the the titanium, you know, firing pins and the light springs and yeah, <laughs> nothing but problems with those things. Like, yeah, it sounds good on paper, but mm -hmm. if you can't ignite that primer. Doesn't matter how fast you. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how fast you, you you do it if 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 you're not actually setting it on yeah. fire consistently, right? And yeah, and you got to ignite it good, so it, it may not miss fire. But if your extreme spreads open way up and your groups open up on paper, uh, because your your ignition is so light, then 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 you you're not helping things then. So yeah, yeah, for sure. So. Uh, Let's talk about gunsmithing because that's kind of your cup of tea, right? Yeah. Um, I, as you may or may not know, Speedy is my mentor. He's when oh, I, yeah. when, Speedy, I great. when I uh, wanted to learn, I reached out to him and uh, he taught me everything I know. <laughs> not everything. I wish he had taught me everything he knows. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> We're working on it. Uh, but he did tell me because I had seen your DVDs by then and all yeah. that, and of course I I asked about that, and he says uh, this is what he told me if I remember correctly. He says Gordy does amazing work. However, we disagree on the methods. He goes and we sit around. He told me that you guys sometimes have lunch together and sit around yeah. discussing each other's method and disagreeing and telling each other why. He goes, however, <laughs> they both work. He goes but exactly. What I'm going to teach you is my method. Now. Obviously, you, you discussed this earlier about, you know, different skinning a cat in different yeah. ways. How have you arrived at your method? 
and how has it changed i guess for the better i assume okay um the camera when it was it had to be 25 years ago or so i suppose now and maybe longer i got a bore scope and man oh man oh man did that open my eyes to a lot of things i started looking in barrels and and I, for, for a long time, I always chambered barrels at both ends. My method is, you know, starts out in a way a lot of, a lot of, that's still a great method doing it, dial barrels at both ends. But I'd spin a barrel, you know, in the lay with a spinning, I'd look at, look through the barrel and a lot of the barrels are spinning in place, but some of the barrels look more like a, like a jump rope. I had a lot of curvature in the bore and, and think a whole lot about it. It was an observation that I'd made to check and everything. And but I got a, but I got a bore scope. And uh, was looking in the in the chamber and noticed that the barrel that had more more of a you know more curvature what I call curvature it's not even a straight curve necessarily I don't really care what it is but but we're not running super straight inside and and uh, but the throats would look different and if I if I had to do it right I really pay attention to it and, and set it up and get my dial indicator. And the bore right where the throat's going to be, get the, the zero run out at that spot. They shot fantastic. That, that was not a problem. The <clears throat> but the throats look different, and it kind of bugged me. I couldn't figure out what the deal was. I'd measure at the back of the chamber, measure at the front of the chamber, neck, the free bore part of the throat. Everything had zero run out. We just just zero. Just you know, maybe a tenth or something like that sometimes. But everything is perfect. So, but but they, they still look different. I couldn't figure out what the deal was. One day I went ahead of the chamber with my indicator, got a, a, a longer tip where I could reach on ahead of the, of the chamber a ways, and I had a bunch of run out. Went farther ahead of the chamber, had more run out. What in the world? Well, yeah, I finally figured out that that's that barrel. So they had both ends of the barrel running true. The right ahead of the chamber, the board was running at a slight angle. So I, so I really, as long as you have your, your, your throat set in, at zero run out, they'll shoot fantastic and be able to look at my Ventress records and world records, everything has been set, set up that way. So it's not a bad method at all. But I did not like that method uh, or that, that the fact that I was getting that run out ahead of the chamber. So I started experimenting. So I started offsetting the outboard end of the barrel until when I went ahead of the chamber an inch or inch and a half, I still had zero run out, just zero all the way through. So I started chambering the barrels that way. And then later on, I realized what I was seeing different, the freeboard, everything looked the same, but I set up my, I do this in my classes now, but I set up a camera, I got a bore scope mount that I mount on my, on my, uh, on my uh, uh, tool post, that I got set up on my, on my digital readout so I can measure the length of things. Well, I start measuring the length of the, of the throat on the lands up ahead of that freeboard. That was different. Hmm. Not a, not a big difference, but it was just enough where I, where I could see that it wasn't quite the same, and I didn't, didn't like that, you know. And and so I just started offsetting the outboard into the barrel, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40,000, whatever it took to get the bore right ahead of the chamber running dead true. So that's how I do barrels now. Is I just set it up and get the barrel run dead true for the first inch, two, you know, one to two inches ahead of the chamber. And then I, of course, I drill out the chamber and and then I run a boring bar through the where the chamber is going to go. We get that running true. So now I can run an indicator from the mouth of the barrel all the way in, even an inch or two past the chamber, still have zero run out. Whatever the outboard end is, the bullet's going to run through the barrel anyway. So if you're going to use that barrel, the bullet's going to follow the curve and and do all that stuff. So so they that part's the same, but it but it evened out that throat. And then if I ever had to set a barrel back, I didn't have to worry about picking up and getting and staying, staying center because sometimes I'd set a barrel back and instead I would have, start having the throat come off center. And I don't do a whole lot of that, but but I sure have over the years a lot of you know for different customers. And that made that a little bit easier to, to, to keep the bore all lined up. I got to set the barrel back a ways. And and uh, so that's that's my preferred way of doing it. And then I clock, now I get then I get involved in thousand yard shooting and so a lot of guys that we're running 308s so they first start out and there's a lot of trajectory in a 308 yeah and they'd be running one inch scopes that you know maybe 40 moa of total and so i just start clocking the barrels up to get, help them get uh more elevation out of it be a more usable elevation that they could use and and uh, so forth but um so i just start clocking the the end of the barrel that's curvy just put that up and uh 
you know, some of the short range guys, the room fire guys, they're experimenting up or down. Uh, if they, I don't know if anybody's ever determined anything better than the other. I've kept track for years, all these years. I still keep track of it. But uh, I can't, the amount of curvature in the barrel, you know, with 10,000 or 50 thousands, does not seem to affect the accuracy at all that I've been able to tell. Absolutely not at all, you know. So I don't worry about that. But, but the clocking, it, it's really more of a scope adjusting thing. I don't think it's an accuracy thing, in my opinion, but it does help scope adjustment. Like every time you put a barrel on it, if the barrel's curved from the side, you, you got a small scope, you may not have enough windage to get to where you can dial it in. Well, that all went away clocking a barrel up or down. So hunting guns now I do up or down. Long range guns I typically do curved up. But it's, it's uh, again, I don't think it's an accuracy thing as much as it is a scope adjusting thing. But so that's kind of my, you know, my method, kind of how I've evolved it to do it that way. So a friend of mine absolutely believes in clocking the barrel, like, and he learned that from from your DVD, and he, and, yeah, and he's like, oh, clocking the barrel. It's just once he started clocking them, they they just like made a world of difference, right? And in, in his his belief is that. <laughs> That's where Hummer barrels come from. You know, he believes in it so much. He says, well, think about it. Hummer barrels are simply barrels that by chance were clocked properly. And uh, I said, okay. And I tried it. And as you said, I have yet to see a difference. Uh, uh, I do everything at a thousand yards and I chambered a few barrels. And I, I, you know, I was really hoping he was right (laughs) (laughs) i mean i am above everything else a competitive shooter yeah i've said that once and many times before i i will try i don't care it's all it's only stupid if it doesn't work right so i'll I'll try it and um and i don't try it in one barrel because as you know you may find this hummer barrel regardless and, and, and it'll just do whatever but I've tried it in three different barrels, and I couldn't see any improvement. So now I'm kind of getting away from it because eh, when you don't clock, it, it's a lot easier to chamber a barrel. Oh, yeah. You don't have to clock it, right? Uh, but anyway, uh, maybe there's something to it. The, the latest thing that I did, just, again, it's only stupid if it doesn't work. I have a big machining center, big lathe, and... Mm-hmm. Uh, I was thinking, because, you know, when, when they drill the barrels, they do gun drilling. They spin the barrel one way, and they spin the drill the other yep. way. And that is supposed to be the ultimate in concentricity and everything, all of the above, right? So I have a subspindle in my lathe. So I I put up a, uh, I put in a uh, true bore uh, mm-hmm. chuck, and and then on the, on the subspindle... I machined a uh, rigid reamer holder, you know, in the lathe, machined it. Yep. Uh, and this, mine is a full mill turn. So I drilled it and tapped it and drilled it and bored it, and it's perfect fit. And uh, and I chambered a barrel. I, I reamed it like, like gun drilling, right? And yep. sure enough, when I got done, there was absolutely no run out. This thing was perfect. I took it out, and I shot it. Shoots really good, but... You know, I've I've had the same results with just chambering my lathe, the you know yeah. my manual yeah. lathe, and uh, I mean it's a lot easier to do. I tell you what, that's how I'm gonna do them going forward, just because the program is already written. So <laughs> I just sure. chuck it up in the lathe and, and do it. But there was not. Uh, I I was really hoping I could see like a, but there, it's just thousand yards is so far away that even if you do everything perfect, if the bullets aren't perfect. Or if the wind isn't perfect. Oh man, yeah. There's so many variables between here and there. So it's a long ways. Um I don't know, man. What what's are you working on something different that maybe you want to tell me? <laughs> Only me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, don't tell anybody else. <laughs> no, really not. I you know, actually I'm building a ton of rivals all the time and continually, you know, continue to do that. And you know, most of my time is other than rifle building is spent working on kind of you know, make, make things better for, for students and classes. You know, I've been teaching classes since well, 97. What is that? 25 years ago now, 26 yeah. years ago. I've been teaching classes of, of, of you know, gunsmithing classes and stuff like that. And 
And, uh, but I'm continually trying to learn how to do that better and, and how to get things better to come across. I'm making, making props and you know, my can't, and you can't really see it here, but, yeah. but, uh, you know, I got a, a rack, a track system basically mounted to my ceiling. I got the, the, my, my 4k camera, uh, -huh. uh, mounted on that I can move over my, my workbench to my lathe, my mill and, and, or anywhere else I can zoom it, you know, yeah. really good camera. So zoom in so I can, for the class, I can I can shoot anything I'm doing. I can I can show and people can see it on the on the big screen TV a whole lot better. They can see it in person. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, so I got that all set up, working good. And that's Gavin's fault. Gavin called the reloader. He made me buy a better camera. <laughs> yeah. Well, he he took a class a couple you know, two or three years ago. He took my chambering class and or my my rifle building class here and and they said, Gordon, you got to get with the programs. I had just a standard definition yeah. video camera hooked up doing this stuff. You got to get a 4k camera. And... They, they, okay, they make I'll a difference, that, especially if you're doing yeah. that type of stuff, you know, where you're showing. Yeah. Detail. But, and nowadays yeah. they're, they're pretty cheap, you know, like, Oh yeah, this is a great, I got a Sony camera, just a super camera. It works so good. But, but if I can really zoom in on stuff, you know, I can yeah. fill up the big screen TV with a, you know, with, with the threads, the, you know, the back end of a barrel or whatever yeah. I'm working on, you know, or, Zoom yeah. down in and see the inside of trigger parts, and everybody can see it greatly magnified. You can really show people and teach people stuff. You know, doing that, and and uh, so the next thing, I'm, and I don't know, I'm no video guy, uh, you know, video editing and how to put stuff online, but but yeah, that's my next goal, and I'm trying to teach myself how to do some of this now. I really need to hire somebody or get somebody that to help me with putting some of this stuff, more of this training stuff online. Yeah, and well, Gavin. Uh, yeah. Gavin can help you with that. He's a master. Oh yeah. He's a master. Yeah. Of that. You uh, don't have time to help me with, with a lot of this day-to-day -day stuff that I need help with. So I need somebody local here. That yeah. <laughs> well, that's for sure. But, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, speedy, uh, I I've been trying to twist this arm as well for a while. It's like, dude, you need to put this on some kind of video format or something. Cause yeah. I mean, here's, here's the way I see things, right? Like you speedy, like Alex Wheeler, I've been trying to get him on, and he he just he just won't do interviews. He's like, nope. I don't, I don't. <laughs> and um, there's so many people that have so much knowledge. And man, I I love what you're doing. I love what Speedy's doing because you guys are actually passing it on. Yeah. Uh, because I could go my entire lifetime, and I wouldn't have learned. I'm positive i wouldn't have learned in an entire lifetime what i've learned from speedy in the last three four years it's just it's just crazy the amount of knowledge that you guys have that once you guys are gone it's gone with you you know oh yes yeah. speedy's a super good gunsmith but he's also a very good instructor so he'll be able to teach you well and and stuff too so that's great so and, and i'm it, it's just incredible and i'm so thankful that you guys are doing what you're doing because there's many gunsmiths out there that know a lot, but that's it. They, they know it, they keep it to themselves and, and that's it. They're yeah. going to take it with them. And man, I, I don't know, you know, like obviously I believe in passing it on, which is the reason I'm doing these interviews, which is the reason I've had a YouTube channel for 14 years where I'm yeah. teaching whatever I can, good or bad. It's, it's out there, you know, and, and, Hopefully it'll yeah, help somebody, great. but man, that's the only way that we're going to grow the sport. And there's no worse thing than a frustrated new shooter on the line. Yeah. If they're not coming back. Yep. That's exactly right. You know, and you know, so, so you, you teach classes. How, how does one take a class from you? you know, I, I do classes two different ways. Okay. I do uh, my, my regular class which is a group class. I have several people that come into a class, you know, five, 10, 12 people, whatever at a time come in like next week. I got a, I got a group class. I got like, like nine or 10 guys coming next week. Uh, going to do a class that's six day class. And I do that. I got, got the class set up. Like I would build a rifle. The first two days is actions. Do all the you know, action blueprinting and do all the stuff you can do to action. The second two days is chambering. Basically you're doing the, the chambering and putting barrels on and, into you know advanced stuff too you know like like recutting different you know doing cutting different necks throating you know different throating and and you know in, in a chamber uh, showing how to do that separately from 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 a chamber ramer you know do a like well, a lot of time I'll do is I'll use a three separate ramer I'll use the main chamber ramer which has a, a tight neck and a short throat then if it's a no turn neck then I'll go to a larger diameter neck and make it into a no turn chamber if that's what the customer wants then I've also got a throating ramer that I that I do uh, I can throw it out for whatever 
in whatever uh, throat the guy wants to run, I can match it to a specific bullet or a specific length or whatever. So I can throat it separately that way. So I show them how to do all that kind of stuff if they want to get into doing that. And the final two days is, I call it the advanced accurizing class. That's the, uh, you know, bedding the stocks. It's finishing up the rifle. You know, bedding the stocks, uh, scopes, triggers, all that kind of stuff. Uh, also, the last two days, just the, all the stuff you would do on a factory rifle too, which is kind of this, all the same stuff. Uh, but it's doing an evaluation. I go through a complete evaluation on a rifle. A lot of that. You evaluate a rifle, try to find out what's, if, the, if the guy has accuracy problems with a rifle, what's going on with it. I've had so often guys send it to me, yeah, it needs to be better. It needs a new barrel. Does it? You know, let's let's do an evaluation and find out what's going on with this gun, and then we'll know what to do with it. Like taking your car to mechanics, yeah, I think it needs this. Well, you just, you just start throwing parts at it and hope yeah. something works. You know, but if you can go through and measure everything and document everything, okay, this is, you know, this is the problem. What well, you're only touching on one on one lug or the barrel, you, you slug a barrel and, and evaluate a barrel, the barrel is super tight right ahead of the chamber. And then goes down, but the last two or three inches of the barrel opens up. That barrel's not going to shoot good because because the bore's enlarged. The end, the bullet becomes unstable before it ever gets out. You start getting gas leakage coming past the bullet, and and uh, well, I haven't you know, bought back at a guy so it couldn't even bed it. Well, the bedding was perfect, but they had a barrel like that. Well, the bedding is not the problem. The barrel is the problem. You know, uh, so just doing evaluation. That's all part of that of that class too. Is, is doing that stuff and and uh, yeah. A lot of stuff with bore scope showing. I got a ton of barrels that I've that I've kept over the years from other projects that I can show to people of what's to look at in, in a barrel, what goes wrong, and and you know, when they got their own bore scope, it's a learning curve, learning what's you're looking at. So so that's all part of that too. So, but I just kind of got it set up as a um, yeah, just a week long class. That's my regular class, and then I also do private classes, private training, one on one training. And then they uh, come to my shop. I occasionally travel to other guys' shops too, and and do it at their place. But but primarily they'll come here, and I do a a one on one with. They can build their own rifle if they want. They can run the machine. A lot of guys, even the regular class people, uh, majority of them have very little experience. Some of them no experience whatsoever. So I got a lot, a lot of handout material, the step by step by step, uh, written as well as photographs, step by step by step, because. You take a week long class and you've not been involved with it much, you're, you're gonna be pretty overwhelmed. But at the same time, you're gonna learn a ton. And then you go home with this handout material and start practicing and learning on your own. You're not gonna be an expert right off the bat, but you absolutely are gonna know what to do and follow this step by step by step. You can do this step, sure. You can do this step, sure. You can do this step, sure. Put all those steps together and you build a rifle. So that's kind of how I've got it set up is to first off, take the fear out of doing that for people. And, uh, and then they go home with a lot of confidence and. and they know what to do and know how to do it. I cover a lot of problems. What what goes wrong? There's so many things that go wrong with uh, like rumor chatter, for example, or or mismeasuring things. I show all that stuff in these classes that that they know how to check for all this stuff to make sure they got everything exact. And and uh, if a problem develops, they'll know what to do to, to, to get out of it. So that's um, that's just kind of how I got how I got the classes set up. But it's either a group class with a bunch of people with a problem they can't work on their own projects or a private class where they can work on their own project. And then they, then they're, they run the lay themselves. Uh, if they've never run a lay before, we'll spend the first half a day by the, by the, even the, by the, even the first half a day, they're, they're turning tenons down the side, they're cutting threads and doing, doing a great job. But they obviously got to go home and practice and get better at it and more, more proficient, but they sure learned the basics and uh, take it from, you know, but take it from there. So, so that's kind of how I've been doing things. So. I just had an idea <laughs> as you were talking. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I got tons of barrels, blanks. Yeah. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to send, I'm going to send you, because you still do gunsmithing, right? Oh, yeah. I might send you two barrels with yeah. my reamer, and I'll tell you, you know, set up my headspace to this dimension. I do 899. The the boardings okay. are nine hundred, so I do eight ninety nine, and you can have do two barrels. Then I'm gonna send two barrels with my reamer to Speedy, and there you go. maybe two to uh, Alex Wheeler, and I'm just gonna shoot them, and then I'll do two myself. Right, that's eight barrels, yeah. and uh, just uh, just see if there's a because one barrel could always be just an exceptional barrel, and I might just test them over time. 
and uh that'd be an interesting test i think it would be and if there's oh, yeah. a, a if there, i suspect there's not going to be a clear winner uh but if there is who knows? Because oh, yeah, yeah, you guys does a great job. Alex absolutely does a straight. Does you a guys are doing things, things different ways. I I don't know yeah. to what extent, but I know you guys are, and you don't have to tell me. Just this is the Gordy Barrels, this is the Speeding, this is the Alex Wheeler, yeah. and then I can just shoot them. And uh, if there's a clear winner, then I can go. All right, fess up. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. Uh, your, your barrels are probably the ones that, that beat them all. <laughs> well, yeah, who knows, right? It, it's just, yeah. uh, I, I just, I think we're all, and okay, forget that you guys, like, I don't want to include myself because I'm, I'm still just an apprentice. I'm, I'm still learning. Every time I talk to Speedy, like as much as I think I've learned from him, every time I talk to him, he's like, oh, by the way, I just found this out. Like he's still every day just trying to find a better way. You know? Oh yeah, uh, and I think you guys are at a level where it's so good that uh, I don't know that you could find much improvement. But it's it's that's how you got there, right? So you keep looking, but sure, it's uh, it's interesting. But the 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 main thing is the feedback, right? Especially yeah. from benchers or from high level competitors. Oh, uh, like you said, if 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 you have a uh, venture shooter or a F class or whatever, that all of a sudden you do something different, all of a sudden they start winning, and then you like, well, let me do another barrel like that, and then all of a sudden they start winning, and then you say, you know, let me try with somebody else, and then you do that for them, and all of a sudden they start giving you feedback, really good feedback, then you know yeah. you're onto something, right? But yeah, it's it's uh, I've I've done some things where. Man, I just swear that I just found the new next best thing. And <laughs> then I tried on the next barrel and it's like, ah, back to reality. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, there's enough, there's enough variances in barrels that that, that makes, it, you'd have to do it over a large test to be able to really tell what's the. Yeah, for one, sure. One particular thing is, is the best or not. So. Yeah. But anyway, so where do they find you, Gordy? Well, I got my. Uh, I don't advertise a whole lot of, you know, doing stuff through, you know, gambling with ultimate reloader. Um, but yeah, that's probably the only place I advertise. Uh, uh, yeah, my, you know, my website is you know, either gordysprecision.com or actor or uh, extreme accuracy institute.com. So extreme uh, accuracy institute or gordysprecision.com. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Same, but go to the same website. It's got two different email addresses to get there. So, okay. Uh, so go to the website. They want to learn from you, take some classes. Yep. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, we need to, we need, we need to grow the sport, man. It's, it's, uh, the way I see it. Some of my best friends I learned, I met shooting. Uh, there are just tons of amazing people out there, uh, that you just haven't met and, or, you know, you as in people that, that are not in the sport. They need sure. to just get in here and, and, and it's a whole nother world of people that are <laughs> common interest, oh, yeah, extremely absolutely. competitive, but yet they'll literally give you a gun that they wouldn't mind getting beat by, and, you know, in your yeah, hands. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. But so many of the guys that, <clears throat> that take my classes, they're, 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 they're serious competitive shooter, but they're doing yourself they like to do it themselves. They want to build their own rifles and stuff like that. Well, that really gets them involved in competitive shooting. And there's so many of my customers over the years that have, that have uh, ended up becoming full, full-time gunsmiths or, or running a, a, you know, a full-time business because they weren't intending to, they just enjoy doing it. <laughs> yeah. You know, they, they enjoy doing it. And, and uh, you know, some of these guys run some pretty big name companies and stuff that guys have taken my class to start with, learned how to do it that way, just as a hobbyist. So they can they get tired of waiting a year to get a, a gun done by a gunsmith. So they and then hope it was right and they got it. So they want to do it themselves. So they start building their own rifles and, and stuff like that. Well, then yeah, some of these guys they really enjoy doing it. When they present their buddies are having to build rifles, and more and more people they're so far behind on rifles they had to quit the regular job to, <laughs> to do that. So that happens over and over. But but uh, those are serious shooters and they're they're serious. Uh, you know, some of these hobbyists that, 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 that I that I train and take my classes. 
they want to do it themselves. They want to learn how to do it themselves. They want to do it the, the very best they can. Well, that's really growing the sport. Yeah. Th- these guys are, are, are taking the sport to the next level because they're innovative and they can believe what some of these guys, how their minds work, man. That's just awesome. The things they come up with and, and thinking outside the box, that's different than what most people have ever, have ever thought of. They, they weren't, they haven't gone to a gunsmithing school per se, where they've learned the, the standard way of doing things like, that a lot of the old time gunsmiths have done. And, and uh, so they're just thinking outside the box or there's so much more information on, on, uh, on, you know, on the firing line. When people go there, they, they learn from other shooters, but if they're involved in themselves. They shoot themselves. Then they start learning, but you got the target thing. What's happening on the target. That's what really counts. Cause that's what's really going to tell you what, what's the, the name of the game is. So. Yeah. Oh, uh, for sure. I mean, you can't deny the target. I mean, you can, you can argue all day long about what's better, what works best it, until you shoot at that target. You're not going to know. Yeah, <laughs> exactly right. And then that's it. <laughs> oh yeah. All discussions are over. Uh, but anyway, well, Gordy, man, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. I hope we get to do it again. Uh, yeah, I feel like we didn't even scratch the surface. Uh, there's so many rabbit holes that we could go down and uh, it, it, they're very interesting to me because I've, I've literally spent days researching a certain topic and going down that rabbit hole. And um, I'll follow it as far as I can. And some of them have been very, very interesting and have given me really good results. And some of them are just been a waste of time. Well, to me, they're never a waste of time because I always tend to learn something along the way. Sure. Uh, oh, yeah. But whenever you're looking at it with a with a wide field of view, like you, even if if this didn't work out, you might get something that could help with this other thing that you work. Oh on. yeah, absolutely. And it's it's very interesting. I I just wish I had more time to uh, <laughs> to uh, to uh, experiment, but. I, I'm still experimenting. Uh, it's it's. Uh, I find that. I think a lot of it is. I find that fun. I find part of it for oh, me. Yeah, is very the, much so. The fun part, uh, trying different things, and sometimes they're a huge flop. But eh, at least I know. But how you learn? <laughs> oh yeah, I love that. So anyway, again, I appreciate it. And uh, part of the deal is now you got to nominate somebody that I, you think I should talk to. I don't have to know them. <laughs> Just, just somebody that you'd say, you know what? I think you need to talk to whoever. Well, I'll, I'll think of someone to let you know. That's All right, sure. you let I'll me know. That. And uh, uh, I just realized this morning before we got on, I, I was reading comments, and uh, uh, Frank Green was commenting on some of these. Oh, yeah. So he's going to get a call from me today. He said, "All right, buddy. Yeah, that's awesome. Put 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 your money where your mouth is. You need to be on the podcast." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He'd be a good one to talk to. Yeah, but he's he's been yeah. uh, apparently he he got wind of the podcast because he was he was commenting this morning on some of the videos. I'm like, all right, Frank, I'm gonna give you the stage, my friend. Hammer down. You bet. All Absolutely. right, Absolutely. Gordy, thank you so much again. Uh, this this has been amazing. Uh, so thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you, Eric. I'll be in touch for sure. All right. Thanks again. Bye bye. Take care.